Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Healthy Kids Revolution. Today is definitely a wonderful day to celebrate the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Earlier today, you all heard Holly Thompson, and then this evening, we have the pleasure of having Carrie Walters with us. She's one of the original IIN grads, and for those of you who know about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, it's the largest nutrition school in the world, and is farming out, educating host and host of health coaches around the country and around the continent and the globe. So if you're looking for a health coach, definitely go to that website, Integrative Nutrition, and see what you can find out. But we have one of their celebrities today. Carrie Walters is not only a holistic health coach, she's a food educator, a motivational speaker, and a multiple cookbook author. So, Carrie, thanks for being on the Healthy Kids Revolution with us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. All right, so you're going to share some really neat stuff with us today. I know parents have heard um, things about cell health. They've gotten a couple of doses of science. Dr. Katz in the very beginning talked about vitamin L, so I was shocked that a scientist was telling us vitamin, that love was one of the key ingredients in having a healthy family. So, um, And I also read your Mother's Day post and thought that was lovely. And again, I saw this, this same vibe reiterated in your Mother's Day um, essay that you had shared with your community. And thought that was beautiful. So can you kind of tell us just a little bit about who Terry Walters is, how you got where you are and where your interest developed in clean eating and clean living? Absolutely. I've actually been um, eating like this much of my life. When I was in college, I um, discovered that I had high cholesterol. And uh, I one doctor told me I needed to go on statins to lower my cholesterol at the age of 20. And mm-hmm. another one told me I needed to eat more brown rice and kale. So I moved off campus and I bought a bunch of cookbooks. And uh, I got an apartment with a kitchen and I started to teach myself how to cook. And to be honest with you, many of those cookbooks failed me because they all had more sugar and more uh, dairy and, and ingredients that I was trying to cut out. And when I tasted the kale and brown rice that first time, I said, whoa, this is not going to be easy. <laughs> so I was determined to um, make it delicious. And, um, you know, between healing myself, then having two children, and healing them as they grew older, um, and sharing this journey with my mom, as you might have read on my blog, um, mm-hmm. the introduction to my first book, Clean Food, talks about how I've really shared this journey with her. Um, all of those things together brought me to the place where I found myself teaching cooking classes in a new community, kind of sharing that wisdom, um, learning from others' experiences, and um, and that Three years into teaching, someone said, could you just bind your recipes? <laughs> and oh. so I did. And I self-published my first cookbook, and it has been um, it has been quite a, an experience ever since then. But my approach has always been that, um, you know, people looked at me like I had three heads when I told them what I ate. And so mm-hmm. one day, all of a sudden, it went from getting those looks to, well, gee, if I ate that way, do you think I'd feel better? Um And so when I became a health coach, what I realized is that most people want to make changes. They just really, they don't have the knowledge or the the expertise, the perspective to do it. And so when I started teaching cooking classes, I was teaching only the foods we all need more of. You know, my books are vegan, my classes are vegan, but it wasn't vegan because I thought vegan is the way. It was vegan Mm -hmm. because... Even if you ate dairy and even if you ate meat, and I'm not one necessarily to judge someone for making a decision like that. Um, There are a lot of things that go into those decisions, but everybody needed more non-animal sources of protein. Everybody needed more dark leafy greens. So these really are the foods we all need more of, and I call it clean food. And so tell us, what is clean food in your mind? Because... I'm sure that could have a lot of variations, but to you, Terry, what is clean food? Well, to me, clean food is our foods that are minimally processed so that we can get the maximum nutrition. And so that can apply to foods that, you know, animal protein and whatnot. But for me, it's, you know, whole grains and abundant vegetables and legumes, nuts, seeds, you know, non-animal sources of protein, good fats, um, and uh, all made easy and delicious because these are the foods that nourish us 
the goal is to eat like this all the time. So we have definitely sacrificed nutritional value for convenience. And my perspective and my goal is to show people that we don't need to. We can have it both. We can have taste. We can have nourishment, great nutrition, and convenience, and good health as a result. Absolutely, and I guess when I thought, when I first looked at clean foods, I was going, hmm, I also thought about the aspect of them being organic and not covered in pesticides. Is that what it was meant by clean versus minimally processed and then local? And I know, I believe your clean food cookbook is the one that is, you're bringing in local, organic, is that right, sustainably grown? Well, I... I shop for as and base my menus around locally grown organic produce. But in okay. my mind, clean is different for each person. And the more we can lift that judgment and just accept where we are um, and do the best that we can and be empowered with knowledge, I think the healthier we end up being no matter what we're eating. So for one person, you know, getting clean, quote unquote clean, might mean giving up um, artificial ingredients in your processed foods. And yet right. for the next person, it could mean giving up those processed foods altogether. And yet, you know, for somebody else, it might mean getting a CSA or going to a farmer's market and getting all your produce from a farm. There is no doubt that if we eat the foods that grow around us, during, you know, in that season, we're going to be more in balance with our environment. And we're not only going to be cleaner on the inside, but we're going to be supporting a cleaner environment, right? Less packaging, less uh, fewer natural resources to get it from the farm to the table. We're supporting our community, our local economy, and, of course, our farmer and a sustainable food system. So, so yes, you know, ideally, there are, are always ideals, but the goal isn't to jump from one extreme to another. The goal is to... Um, focus on bringing in and nourishing yourself um, the best that we can. I think so, too, and that when you were saying that, it gave me a wonderful visual of a spectrum. And we are all on different spectrums because we're all unique individuals with different backgrounds and different exposure. But I think that my word of encouragement to our audience would be, like you said, this is a judgment-free zone. No one is judging where anyone is on the spectrum. We just encourage you wherever you are on the spectrum Hopefully you can take little baby steps forward going farther to the right to get all the way over at some (laughs) point to have a very clean, healthy lifestyle. But, again, it's a process, it's a journey, and just making steps forward is so encouraging and so beneficial for our children. Right, and those those steps are are motivated by knowledge. And I think when it Mm -hmm. comes to nourishing our children, it's really important it's almost more important to have a dialogue around what that food is and what makes it clean and, you know, how it nourishes us and how we need to eat all the colors of the rainbow to get balanced nutrition and that there are five tastes, more than just sweet and salty, there's sour and bitter and pungent, and that balanced nutrition comes from eating all of those tastes in a nutritional way so we don't crave it non-nutritionally, right? And the more we have this dialogue with our children, that Mm -hmm. is more empowering. That's what helps them to make healthy choices. You can put down beautiful meals that are as clean as a whistle, you know, three times a day, seven days a week, but that is not helping your children to make good choices, and that's not giving them any tools to nourish themselves when they leave your home. You know, so I don't actually see my job as getting this food into them. I see it as absolutely providing it, but more importantly, providing the knowledge so that they can make those healthy choices. And, you know, when I was, when my children were younger and I had control over everything they ate, I mean, to some degree, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, it was, um, I wanted to think that I I was going to do the best I could and I was, you know, going to give them the perfect diet. But even then, you know, if they don't like something, they're not going to eat it. And the truth is I fed my children collard greens and kale almost every night for two years before they said, fine, we'll eat it. (laughs) And I, you know, there was always something healthy on the table and always something that they liked. Um, And for me, the important thing was, you haven't had green yet today. It's dinner time. You can pick the green. 
you know, and sometimes it was frozen peas and sometimes it was green beans, but very often it was kale and collard greens. And I just ask that, you know, if you haven't tried them in a while, you try them again. Um, and I serve it family style so that they're taking, you know, they're empowered to take what they want. There's nothing right. worse than putting a huge pile of expectation in front of your child in the form oh. of kale or collard greens. You know, if she, if my children took one leaf and ate it, even if they hated it, I said, that's fine, you know. Um, the one thing I never did was I never said, it's okay that you don't want it. I'm going to go and make you something, you know, white <laughs> and fill you with something empty. I This is what okay. dinner looks like. And if you don't want dinner, then, you know, there'll be breakfast tomorrow morning as well. <laughs> you can have something then. Um, but, you know, dinner always was a rainbow of color. Every meal had that rainbow of color. Um, and, you know, over time they kept the message. And not everybody has to like kale. But we really, I don't know one person on this planet who wouldn't be improved by, whose health wouldn't be improved by eating more greens. So True. the most important color, <laughs> as I tell my kids. And I think I read it, there was a statistic somewhere recently that I read that, you know, our, it would be wonderful if we could consume about 75% vegetables, green kind of fruits, nuts, vegetables in that category versus the protein. But we as a country are really only consuming about 15% of our diet in that category. So I love that you have this cookbook that's going to offer parents easy, simple recipes. And I would be curious, how did you serve the kale? For two years you're serving kale. Was it, how did you serve it? Well, it's funny because, well, kale chips, when I discovered kale chips quite by accident because I was roasting um, some vegetables, some winter squash with kale because the kids liked winter mm-hmm. squash. And that's a great way to start building your taste is to put a new food in with something that you already know you and your kids love. So if they love your minestrone soup, chop up one leaf of kale and put it in. And then the next time, chop up two leaves of kale and put them in. And all of a sudden, you're developing a taste for kale. So quite accidentally, I was roasting some um, kabacha squash with some kale, and the kale got very crispy. And Mm. that's the kale that my kids ate for the first time, but more often than not, I'd saute it with some ginger, maybe some leeks, a little bit of soy sauce or mirin. You never know. It was was different every night, maybe just some olive oil and um, my favorite vice, umi plum vinegar, (laughs) or a little sea salt. Um, Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is that when I launched Clean Food that very first time and went on my book tour, my youngest, who really um, doesn't like to be on the cooking side of the kitchen, would much rather be at the counter or at the table eating. Um, She came to me and said, Mom, what am I going to do when you're gone? Who's going to make my collard greens? (laughs) So she can't make much in the kitchen, whereas my oldest is quite quite talented. But but she can make killer sautéed collard greens. And she goes to the farm and she asks Farmer Mike, are there collard greens? And if not, can I go pick them? And she loves it. So, you know, time, patience, knowledge, empowerment, they're really good keys to to giving your kids a healthy start. Well, I like what you mentioned about the five taste and exploring with children. I don't think I've ever really heard much of a discussion, and I would love if you would take a moment and maybe go a little bit deeper with us as if you were talking to you know, teaching us how to talk to our children about the five tastes and having that variety on the table. So what is the dialogue around that? Well, it's interesting because the more processed food we eat, so the more the food comes in the package, the more accustomed we are to two tastes. And as I tell my children, you always want to be able to visualize how your food grows. So if there's no package, kind of what you see is what you get, right? Whole grains are grains, vegetables, fruit. We know what those things are. But the second we see a package, now we, in order to know what's in it, we have to read a label. So reading labels is a, one of the most important places to start. If you are looking at a package, you know you're a little bit removed from the source. But if mm-hmm. instead of putting it down and going back to something that's not in a package, you really do want the package, Then read the ingredients. And frankly, I know there are people who say it should have five ingredients or fewer. It can have as many ingredients as as you want. 
as long as you can visualize how they grow. The second you start getting to words that sound like they are chemical formulas or, as I like yeah. to say, come from the cement kind of a plant, not you know the processing plant, not the green kind of plant, mm-hmm. those, if it sounds Greek in your mind, it's going to not be translated in your body. And so put it back and get something else that has ingredients that you can identify. You know, if it has carrots in it, if it has brown rice in it, we know what those things are. If it says mono, dye, partially hydrogenated, right, or any of those words, those are the things we want to put back. Now, when it comes to tastes, sweet and salty are the two most processed tastes. So when we eat a processed food diet, our taste buds become addicted to those intense flavors, which are very different than the more subtle sweet and salty that we get from plant-based foods. Mm. So it is not the kind of thing where if you're eating a highly processed food diet, you want to just jump from one extreme to another because you're going to wonder, where's all the flavor? It doesn't taste like anything. But if you can take small steps on that spectrum, you know, if it if it is, uh, oats are the, the thing I like to use. If you're eating um, Fruit Loops, and let's just pretend that they have oats in them, and you move to um, the instant oatmeal where you rip open the package and add the water, and poof, there's apples and walnuts, and <laughs> right? Exactly. Then that's a step closer to the source. And if you're eating the rip open the package and add water, and you move to quick cooking, which take two or three minutes, oats, and put your own apple and walnuts in, now you're even another step closer to the source. And you can keep taking these baby steps one at a time, and you're going to get cleaner on the inside, your taste buds are going to change, your digestion's going to change, your lifestyle, everything changes, and your health slowly, and it makes a really nice transition. Now, Sweet and salty are the two highly processed tastes. The others are sour, so that's like your lemon, right? Bitter, those are your dark leafy greens. And pungent, and pungent could be like blow the roof of your mouth off heat, um, hot peppers and things like that, but it can also be cinnamon, which is one of my favorite pungent tastes, Um, cumin, uh, mm-hmm. ginger, even uh, raw garlic can be pungent. And they really, they just create heat in your core and movement and digestion. So sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and pungent. And the more we get all those tastes, the more balanced we are. I love that. And I think, again, that's a wonderful thing to have experimenting. I know I've found success with children, and you said that you also go into schools and are able to teach children. And I'll take a tray of a variety of raw vegetables, like a radish, and they've never really – most kids have not had radishes or turnip fruit. And they were, I could see certain children just devouring it, that it was a new experience. And I forewarned them that it was hot. You know, they might have a little heat to it. And so they still stepped up. And like you said, they had the choice of did they want to try it, how much of it did they want to have. There was no limit on how much they could have. They just had to eat what was on their plate. And it was a really neat eye-opening experience. And these children went home to their parents and were now able to say, Mommy, I had a radish. Mommy, I tried a turnip root today. It was really good. And so, again, some exposure to these children was very helpful. Mm-hmm. I did a great program last year. We have this uh, free day camp for city youth called Camp Current. It's actually the longest-running um, free day camp for inner-city youth in the country. Phenomenal program. And I went one day, uh, we had a, a whole farm-to-table dinner that the kids prepared at our local culinary school. But the day before that, I just went in with a snack, to really to open their minds and their palates more than anything. And so I, I brought my blender in, and we made these great smoothies with bananas and strawberries and, and rice milk, and the kids were so excited. And then I took out some kale, and everybody wanted mm-hmm. the smoothies, and you're not going to put that in there. It's going to ruin it, <laughs> right? And, exactly. Um, and I put the kale in, and the smoothies turned bright green, and everyone plugged their noses and said, no way, no way. And then one person took a sip, and... Everybody else followed suit, and they loved them. And 
we instantly talked about what do you eat that's green in your diet and what does this green do? It provides, you know, it, it provides minerals and calcium to make your bones strong. It nourishes your nervous system. It nourishes, it, it strengthens, uh, helps strengthen your liver and your digestion. You know, it nourishes almost every system in the body. And how difficult was that to take one leaf of kale and put it into a smoothie? So um, it was just so so rewarding and so great. And I, you know what? These city youth, they're not the only ones that can benefit from seeing how we can bring dark leafy greens in. <laughs> uh, I, my neighbors, my some of my friends, myself, often I need that reminder of, oh, geez, I'm not eating my greens, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So exactly. we all need the reminder of what real food is, especially as our food system moves further from the source. That change is going to come from us, demanding foods with nutritional value, remembering what real food is, that it comes from the green kind of plant. That's what's going to give us the nourishment to be healthy. And I have. I feel like you and I are living parallel lives here, and I did a little bit of the reverse of what you did, and so I was teaching kids, and I took my blender into the schools, and I started out with the spinach, and I was like, who likes raw spinach? And they were all like, eh, we're not going to eat that. Exactly. <laughs> so I blended up the spinach, and then I did, like you said, and I threw in a banana and pineapple. I said, wait, 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 I'm going to put in some cool things, and you're not even going to taste the green. And then I threw in bananas and pineapples, you know, so ended up making this smoothie. And then I encouraged, I said, okay, I need to know who's going to be the first one to volunteer. And they all, like, want to be, you know, everybody wants to be first. And, and like, eight or nine hands went up, I do, I do. And I pick a volunteer and I say, okay, let's put pillows around because she or he may fall over and faint. And we don't want them to die from this gooey, gooey green smoothie. And they're like, oh, no. And then the kid will drink it. And then they just look around and they give a thumbs up. And then all the kids are clamoring, and they're coming back for seconds and thirds. And I've had little kids that will only eat, like, mac and cheese and french fries come up and still do this with me. You know, so Carmen, it's, it's such a good point. It's So much of it is about oh, is about creating awareness. One of the things that I did with my children, I didn't know it, it was one of my uh, parental moments of greatness, and there are so <laughs> few that it's, you know, it's easy to keep track. <laughs> but oh, one of the things that I did when my kids were little was, Every Friday morning, we'd um, take all of our garbage and recyclables to the dump, and then every Friday afternoon, we went to the farm. And um, yeah, I really, you know, it was it was my saving grace of just knowing that okay, these are the things that we're going to do, and they're going to get done. And um, I had no idea the message that I was sending, but in hindsight, now that my kids are older, I realize that from that they definitely learned that everything comes from someplace and everything wow. goes someplace and that they play a really important role in that cycle. And um, it's been really fascinating for me to watch that. But from taking them to the farm, letting them pick the produce we want, um, help letting them or involving them in not only planning meals but making meals and cleaning up the meals and planting the garden. When we planted our garden last year, my youngest grabbed, I'm planting arugula. Okay, go ahead, plant arugula. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she planted this huge space of arugula. And when it was time to harvest it, I brought it in. She was so excited. She watered it. She weeded it. She loved it. And I made that first salad and she took one bite and she ran to the sink and spit it out. Oh, no. <laughs> now, I love arugula, so it wasn't all Oh, all that for hard work. <laughs> but she said the first words out of her mouth as she realized she didn't like arugula at all were, next year I'm planting. <laughs> oh. And I thought, that's so great because, one, if I brought arugula home, she would have never tried it. And mm-hmm. she was instantly thinking about something else. Um, so, you know, kids love to get into the garden. They love to plant things, whether you have a big garden, whether you're taking them to a farmer's market, or even planting some herbs to put on your windowsill. Um, There's a recent study that came out that shows that the more, or that children who spend time in the dirt, in the garden, weekly, actually do, uh, are better students. They have improved test scores. They have improved performance in school. And think about that. 
that's just being in the garden. That doesn't even touch upon what happens when they actually eat the fruits of their labor. So the potential here to raise kids that are healthy and to create a sustainable food system um, around that is is enormous. Seems like we need to go back to Little House on the Prairie, and all of us, you know, have this farm. And I know, in you know, in large cities, it's, that's not a feasible option. But for so much of the country that does have the land space, to and a lot of schools are starting to adopt gardens, but it's more on a more on an, of an experimental basis. At least in the South, it hasn't caught on as like an integral part of the school day that these children make the garden grow and maintain it on a level that could nourish the children for their lunches. So to sustain them for the day, I think that, you know, that would be a wonderful goal for us to eventually achieve is that's an integral part of their school day is nurturing and tending and growing their own food that they will eat that day at school. I so, hope that when we do a kids' food revolution, healthy kids' revolution yes. in the future, a decade from now we'll be looking back on what we what we shared today and um, – and saying how incredible that now every school in the nation has a garden. And I work in inner city New Britain in Connecticut with the schools here and Urban Oaks Organic Farm. And, you know, it, it, you don't need land to have a garden. You need um, a pot and a pot perhaps a, <laughs> um, a box where you can grow, you know, a, you can grow your own herbs, you can grow your own greens. And... Um, you know there are there are lots of ways in especially in cities where lots of programs where students are brought to rooftop gardens to community yes. gardens um so mm -hmm. there are more opportunities than we think and um local harvest and .org and um the nrdc.org um, I believe it's .org, are great resources where you can put in your zip code and find all sorts of opportunities in your locale I, you just, I think that might be what the the next Healthy Kids Revolution is, and we were, we actually have one scheduled for the fall, and are just, you know, as I'm brainstorming and and interviewing all of you experts, Terry, I think that would be a fantastic resource for parents. Is let's deep dive into how do we get the schools integrated and getting all the resources that are available and get this movement started so that we do have this happening in our schools for our children. Yeah, yeah, and it is it is starting. I I wish I could tell you that you could go online and get a a sheet of best practices so that you could just lift mm -hmm. it and do it in your community, um, but I don't think that exists yet. But we're getting really close to that. So um, at least here in the state of Connecticut, we are, and I know there's a lot of progress being made elsewhere as well. So stay tuned; it's happening. Yes, <laughs> yes I know. This is a great conversation. I was trying to think if there were um. Any other best tips or practices? I know you talked, um, when you and I first spoke, you mentioned something about cruise director. And I'm uh -huh. thinking what context that was and what, what what were you talking about there? Yeah, I think that it's just important as parents that we accept that our children are different than we are and that they're going to have okay. different tastes. And most importantly, you know, respect that. Don't Let's not judge ourselves for not providing, you know, the best meals. Let's just... Take it one step at a time. Do the best we can. Have a healthy dialogue around it. And most importantly, when you go to the grocery store, take a deep breath and just connect with that intention to buy the foods that are going to serve you and your family. Because it's so much easier to make the hard choices once at the grocery store than it is to have to be forced to make that every time you open up your, your pantry or your cupboard. Um, so bring only those nourishing foods home. There will be plenty of opportunities for, for splurges outside of the home. And that way, when you're in your home as a parent, you really, this is where I am the cruise director and mm -hmm. not a policeman. You know, instead of saying, no, you can't have this, I say, um, you know, what colors have you had? And I direct them that way. So what colors haven't you had today? Yeah, why don't you find something in this color? Or what taste haven't you had? You know, and so that I'm really helping them to round out their diet and not having to say no all the time because no parent likes that. And that brought, you've, you've said this multiple times now in this conversation about eating a rainbow, and there is um, a lady named Kia Robertson, and if parents that are listening in want to look up eating a rainbow, she has principles and charts that your kids can use. They're obviously Frid Kinley, 
kid-friendly charts that show on a daily basis how many of the colors of the rainbow that the child has eaten. And it's a good tracking method and also a very good visual for the children to remember what, what you're saying, Terry, is, you know, have you had all the colors today? Um, and I think that's very valuable. And then the last thing that I would pull back in is, again, Dr. Katz at the very beginning said, he talked about vitamin L, so our love being important. But the other point that he drove home, which I was not expecting, was that he his idea is making it fun for children. So when you and I were talking about why kids should eat greens, because it's going to build their bones and it's going to give them a good digestive system, that's something they may or may not relate to depending upon how old they are. But every kid universally understands having fun. And so if you can relate it back to, you know, it helps your digestive system, which means you'll feel good, your tummy won't hurt, and you know what? You have more fun when your tummy's not hurting. So, again, if we relate it on something that children can really attach themselves to, of having fun, having more energy, running and playing with their friends, uh, I just thought that was a very brilliant piece of the puzzle for Dr. Katz to bring in. I think that's why Popeye was so successful. (laughs) Is that why Popeye was? Well, don't you think? I mean, really, absolutely. It makes us strong. And when we're strong, we're able to enjoy all that life has to offer. And I did eat that canned spinach because of Popeye. I really did. (laughs) Even though it was disgusting, I thought, look at those muscles. That is so cool. So, um, And before we close, Terry, any last thoughts that you would want to share with our audience? I do have the slide up now. Again, just sort of directing everyone back to find out more about you and your cookbooks. Um, You know, and I saw a recipe you had on here of something wrapped in collard greens. I know that if this is... And, again, we're talking about people having, parents having to step out of your comfort zone because, for me, I grew up in the South with a few vegetables. I know turnips, mustard, and collards. I had never heard of Swiss chard, you know, until I was, like, 35 years old. I wasn't living in a cave, but just southern food didn't always incorporate all these interesting root vegetables and greens. And so I'm hoping that your clean food cookbook will be a great source for parents wanting to tiptoe in and dabble in and really make a concerted effort to put more vegetables on the table. You've got a resource here for them that gives them easy recipes. So what would you say about your book? Anything else you might want to share about how it can help parents in that regard? Well, the collard green recipe you're talking about actually came, the inspiration came from a client whose son was um, gluten-free, and Mm -hmm. she got so fed up that one day she just said, you know what, I'm going to just make his sandwich and wrap it in a collard green. And he came home and said, oh, that was so great. And I thought to myself, it was? (laughs) I don't know if my kids would buy that. So I made my, you know, favorite dumpling filling and I wrapped it in collard greens and I gave it to my kids and lo and behold they ate it and so I think the lesson there is to let go of our own judgments and to just let the food nourish us and take it one step at a time and be easy on yourself and your family and because those judgments they cloud us you know sometimes maybe eating dinner is more nourishing than breakfast and but we have this judgment that we're supposed to have a cereal or that a sandwich has to have bread if we let go of all of that and especially as parents, the the need to, you know, provide and be that perfect caregiver and um, and the perfect cook. You know what? There's no such thing as perfection. It's all about doing the best that we can. So I think the more we share that, you know, through programs like yours and through um, connection with our community, I, I think the better off and the more nourished we all are. And in doing so, we take off the burden on food and uh, we become nourished by all that life has to offer and that is always to our benefit. I love it. Well, you have been just a wonderful expert to have on here and I think the pearls of wisdom that you've shared certainly are going to help many people and I would encourage all of you if you learned something from Terry today to please share it with your friends and your mommy groups on your Facebook page. We all need to know what things are working with our children so that we can make better improvements. So, Terry, thank you again so much for being part of the Healthy Kids Revolution, and hopefully we'll get to partner again maybe in the Healthy Kids Revolution too and bring you back with some more great ideas. Thanks, Carmen. Looking forward to it, and thanks to all of your listeners as well. Oh, have a great night.